Welcome to Crime Soup Podcast. I'm your host, Kaylee Carter. And I'm Hannah. And this week we'll be discussing the unsolved double homicide of two teenage sisters in St. Cloud, Minnesota in 1974. This is the story of Mary and Suzanne Raker. Our story starts with the Raker family. Frederick John Raker, age 45, and his wife Rita Marie Raker, born Rita Marie Bechtold, age 38, were both devout Catholics that got married in 1958 in Stearns, Minnesota, and immediately started having kids. Fred worked as a warehouse supervisor at the Liturgical Press in St. John's University in Collegeville. For those unfamiliar with St. John's University, it's a small private Catholic university in Collegeville, Minnesota, and the Liturgical Press, where Fred worked, is a publishing company that publishes Catholic literature. Okay, so it's safe to say that Fred and Rita aren't just Catholic, they're devoutly Catholic. So I have to ask, how many kids do they end up having? At this time, in September 1974, they have six kids aged 4 to 15 years old. There was Mary, 15, Elizabeth or Betsy, 13, Suzanne or Susie, 12, Martin or Marty, 10, Matthew, 8, and Leah, 4. Our story begins on September 2nd, which happens to be the Monday of Labor Day weekend. For those outside the United States, Labor Day is a national holiday in America that's supposed to celebrate the social and economic achievements of laborers. It's always observed the first Monday in September and a lot of businesses are closed. Most people get together with family or friends to barbecue and sort of celebrate the end of summer vacation because a lot of schools start up again after Labor Day. In Minnesota, where the Raker family lives, Labor Day weekend is also when the Minnesota State Fair happens in St. Paul. On this particular Labor Day in St. Cloud, Minnesota, it was overcast and about 50 degrees outside when the Rakers' 15 and 12-year-old daughters, Mary and Susie, left their home at 224 18th Avenue North to make the one-mile journey to the local shopping center to buy a few small things for school. Mary was the Rakers' oldest child. She was a sophomore at a private Catholic school in Little Falls, and she was described as outgoing, got good grades, and was active in her school's band and chorus. She was 5 feet 3 inches tall and about 110 pounds with short brown hair, green eyes, and wire rim glasses. Susie was the Raker's third oldest child. She was a 7th grader and she was described as a shy homebody who loved playing the violin, which she practiced 2 hours a day and played in her school's orchestra. She was 4 feet 11 inches tall and about 100 pounds with waist-length dark brown hair, brown eyes, and gold wire rim glasses. The walk to the shopping center wasn't very far, only three or four blocks from their house, and the two girls were old enough to walk there by themselves. Not to mention, St. Cloud was a relatively safe area, and Mary and Susie were responsible and always told their parents exactly where they were going and when they'd be home. Fred was spending his Labor Day painting their house when his daughters left about 11 or 11.30 that Monday morning and waved goodbye to them, not knowing it would be the last time he'd see his two daughters alive. We know that Mary and Susie made it to the Zayer Shopping Center because witnesses described seeing them at the Shopco at about 12 to 1.30 p.m. But what happened next is a mystery. About 5 o'clock that evening, Fred and Rita started getting worried when Mary and Susie still hadn't returned home from shopping. It wasn't like them to change their plans without letting their parents know, and their shopping trip shouldn't have taken this long. By 6 o'clock, the Rakers called the police and reported the girls missing. Although they made it clear that Mary and Susie weren't the type of teenagers to run away, the police felt confident that the girls probably weren't met with foul play. St. Cloud didn't get very much violent crime except the occasional domestic dispute, and they definitely didn't get any stranger abductions. They told the Rakers the girls probably just hopped on a bus to visit friends and they should check with the employees at the Greyhound bus terminal. 
Okay, so when I first read this, I thought it was a little bit weird because I guess it depends on where you're from, whether or not it's normal for teenagers to just hop on a bus and like go out of town. I personally did not do that as a teenager, but I think this actually is a little bit normal for for these circumstances because Mary, she attended a private school that was like 30 to 40 minutes away. And I think she was really familiar with the bus system and I think she used it regularly. So I don't think it's completely out of the ordinary for these girls to potentially take the bus. Okay, that makes sense because I, I was like, what the hell? They hopped on the bus and left? Like, why would you even say that? While the Rakers didn't think their daughters would just randomly get on a bus and leave town, they still decided to ask the Greyhound employees anyway. And strangely enough, the bus ticketer did remember selling tickets to a couple of girls that seemed to match Mary and Susie's descriptions. But as the Rakers followed this lead, they found the two girls who bought bus tickets to Little Falls on Monday, and one of them only slightly resembled their 15-year-old daughter. A dead end. So where did they go? Where could their daughters have gone? Despite Fred and Rita's pleadings with St. Cloud Police, Mary and Susie were treated as runaways and they continued to follow up on various tips from half a dozen people that claimed to have seen the girls hitchhiking, but none of the tips led anywhere. After 10 days, the police decided to distribute missing person posters with the girls' pictures on them to other police departments in the state of Minnesota, believing Mary and Susie probably left town, despite Fred and Rita's insistence that their daughters wouldn't do that. Mary and Susie were both happy children. They liked school. They had no reason to run away. 10 days is a long time. 10 days is way too long. If my children were missing even just for one day, I would be freaking out, right? Because from all of the accounts that I've read, these were really responsible teenagers. And that's what their parents said, is that they could always rely on these girls to tell them before they did any kind of change of plans. So when they said that they were gonna go to the shopping center and that they would be right back, it was really out of character for these two particular girls to not come back or to communicate that they were changing their plans. So the idea that they would get on a bus and leave town, it's just not like them. Even if they did get on a bus and leave town, they were 15 and 12. They were missing juveniles. Like, yes, it's the police's responsibility to look for them at that point. Like, it, you don't even have to be gone for 24 hours as, as a minor before you're considered a missing person. Do you think it was just different in the 70s? I guess it would have to be because there's so many cases like this. Like, I feel like we cover a lot of cases where kids go missing and the police are like, they're probably just out playing. They're probably just out hanging out with friends. And then they they fucking go missing. <laughs> so to be fair, I mean, everything that I've read from like, FBI statistics about like missing people, especially missing children, is that an overwhelming majority are runaways who like left without any kind of foul play or ill intention and came home within like a day or two. Even then, these are the types of incidences that I feel like police should be taking really seriously. Even if kids do come back in a day, they're vulnerable for that whole day, wherever they are. Like, yeah, in this case, it's a small town and he's already admitted like the police have already admitted that it's not a high crime area. So what else are they doing with their time? <laughs> I feel like it's less about resources and more about priorities because I, I think police look a lot into petty theft, a lot of property crimes. And I feel like the crimes that they're really needed, they fall short every time. Like sex crimes, they fall short every time. Violent crimes, they fall short almost every time. Like, mm -hmm. Well, missing they're not children. Really, you've said before that they're not really properly trained to handle those kinds no, of cases. They're not. And I mean, and especially, okay, it's, it's a double-edged sword because in places where violent crimes and sex crimes do happen a lot, they don't have a lot of the manpower or training to be really effective. And then in places where there's low crime, they don't have the training, but they especially have the resources to do something, but they don't have the training to do anything about it. So they usually don't have experience. We saw that with like the, the Idaho stabbing case these last couple months where it's a small college town and they don't get a lot of major homicides, especially not a quadruple homicide slash mass murder. And they had to get the FBI's help. Yeah, but I, I think it's generally the culture of policing, the the way that we view policing, the way that police officers are trained. I mean, it was pro it was most definitely different in the 70s, obviously. I still think that they didn't do their job properly. Uh, 
After 16 days, Fred and Rita tape recorded a radio broadcast asking Mary and Susie to come home. They didn't really think their daughters had run away, but they knew it wouldn't hurt to create the broadcast just in case. After 22 days, St. Cloud Mayor Alquin Lohr, State Senator Jack Kleinbaum, and area law enforcement representatives decided to request the use of two helicopters, one from the National Guard and one from the Minnesota State Patrol, but they needed Governor Wendell Anderson's approval first. Once they received approval, the two helicopters were used to search the immediate St. Cloud area. According to G. Perry Olson, Civil Defense Director for the city, It was a perfect day for searching. We were able to see the bottom of the lakes and rivers and quarries, but we found nothing. We flew over cornfields and were able to see dogs running down the rows. We could see fish in the river, but we found no trace of the girls. 22 days later? They're a little late to the game. This is, this is like a month. Like they waited a month. Like, do you remember our episode on Nancy Perry Baird? They had helicopters out looking for her literally the next day. Yep. And that was a y- only a year after this. That was in 1975. So I understand, like, maybe they just don't have helicopters readily available. But, like, maybe after a week would be a more acceptable time frame to be like, okay, they are not runaways. They are not coming home. They're underage. We need to find them. Let's get the helicopters. Let's fill out whatever paperwork and get whatever kind of permission we need and get this done. But 22 days? That is insane to me. I, I just don't know how Fred and Rita are are handling this. They probably were very upset. Yeah, I'm sure they freaking were. Usually kids who go missing who are 12 and under are dead within 24 hours. Like 75% of them are dead within 24 hours. I think she got lumped in, even though she was 12. A lot of times in the articles I read, they were described as being teenagers. And so I think that also didn't help because teenagers are seen as like irresponsible and impulsive and they're more likely to run away. But Susie was a little girl. She was 12. Mary was last seen wearing blue jeans and an army fatigue jacket with Raker printed on the front. And Susie was last seen wearing a white cotton short jacket and blue corduroy jeans. Finally, after 26 days on September 28th, the Raker's worst nightmare came true. It wasn't the police department, the FBI, or the helicopter crews that finally found the girls, but two teenage boys goofing around on a Saturday afternoon at an abandoned quarry. Minnesota is known for its granite quarries, which is a type of mine called an open pit mine, where granite is harvested. It leaves behind a large pit that eventually fills up with water and often creates a perfect swimming hole. There's actually a place called Quarry Park just outside of St. Cloud with 20 of these abandoned mines, and it's a hotspot for families in the summertime to go swimming. As you can imagine, quarries are also a magnet for teenagers looking for something to do. If you've seen Netflix's Stranger Things, then you probably remember that infamous scene where Mike jumps off a cliff in season one, but Eleven uses her telekinesis to save him. That scene was filmed in a granite quarry, much like the quarries found near St. Cloud. On this particular Saturday afternoon, two teenage boys were goofing around at one of the many abandoned quarries outside of town, when about 50 feet away from the water, tucked under some brush, they found the badly decomposed body of 12-year-old Susie Raker, fully clothed with 12 to 13 stab wounds. Four hours later, divers found the body of 15-year-old Mary Raker, stabbed five to six times, except she was naked from the waist down. Her pants and underwear appeared to have been thrown off the cliff, but settled among the rocks. Okay, can we talk about how the police had just flown over, according to them, they just flew over all of the local quarries four days before this. The water was supposedly perfectly clear and they didn't see Mary. It's just two teenage boys that eventually find them. I think this is a case of they were doing it to satisfy the town, like to prove that they weren't here. They really did run away somewhere. Like, oh, so maybe they weren't even really that interested in looking. Like they, they got the helicopter, the two helicopters for appearances almost. Just to make, just to settle the family down, I guess. That's what it sounds like, honestly. I think you're right that they were, the police were convinced like this is a quiet town. The only explanation is that they're not here and that they left town and that they're runaways. And then like you said, to, to kind of prove it, they're like, okay, just to prove it to you, we're gonna, use these helicopters, we're gonna look, and oh, we didn't find anything. But literally it said that they searched all of the local quarries, and this was only two and a half miles away, and apparently the water was perfectly clear. 
Wouldn't, wouldn't they have seen her? Wouldn't they have been able to see Mary's body? I feel like they would have, but I guess not. Yeah, I'm just confused. And then based on a few different accounts, um, depending on where you read about this case, some of the details are a little mixed. How exactly her body was in the water, I'm not 100% certain. One account said that she was four feet under the surface, but that the water in total was 40 feet deep. Maybe I don't understand the dynamics of water or bodies in water. It seems weird to me that someone would just be suspended four feet below the surface, unless when a body has been stabbed like hers has five to six times because I always just assumed that most bodies float in water. So we actually learned about this in one of my criminal justice classes. And of course you did. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember. So bodies sink at first and then later due to decomposition, they float, but it depends on whether the water is warm or cold and, it, it, and yeah, and then it depends. Okay. So it but sounds like she She would have, you're saying she would have sunk at first. Yeah. And then as she decomposed and gases formed in her body, she would have floated. But since she was stabbed, maybe she wasn't as buoyant as a normal body. It makes sense that she was suspended a little bit under the water. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) But it does seem weird that they included that the the water was 40 feet deep. Almost like it was like, it was a long way down. Like it's possible that... It was totally understandable that we missed her here, like when we flew over, because it was 40 feet deep, even though she was only four feet down and the water was perfectly clear. Like adding that in almost feels like they were trying to compensate for their misstep. And there were many missteps along the way. But what do you think? Do you think it was like a distraction? Well, I don't know if I don't know if the 40 feet deep number came from the police or the investigators. I think it's just a, a known fact about the area that like, oh, this quarry is 40 feet deep. Ah, okay. I was reading into it weird then. That's not surprising. That's how you get crime solved though, is taking a weird interest and being suspicious of people. (laughs) (laughs) And I am suspicious of all you, all you hoes. No murder weapon was recovered, although divers searched the water several times. The quarry was about two and a half miles away from the shopping center where the girls were last seen alive. Something that really bothers me. So we know that the quarry is two and a half miles away, so not close. I don't have an answer to this, and I don't even know if it's worth speculating, but how did they get to the quarry? I guess you could argue that, um, I mean, I could, someone could, might be able to convince me to walk two and a half miles if it was someone that I knew. If you were a kid in a neighborhood, you were like making friends. The only thing that really makes sense is that they were coerced into a car or literally just picked up somewhere. I think those are the major two. I feel like they were like threatened and like coerced to get into a car and were driven to the quarry or complete opposite is that there wasn't really any coercion. It was someone that they knew. And actually the police stated after finding the bodies and in doing their investigative work that they believed it was someone local. And in a small town like this, that means it was probably someone that the girls were familiar with. And that would be someone that could convince me like, hey, what are you doing? Do you wanna go hang out at the quarry? (laughs) as teenagers do. I don't know. We're also assuming that they died at the quarry. Yes, that's the other thing I don't know. that they they didn't die at the quarry. Like whoever picked them up, took them somewhere else and dumped them at the quarry. That's true. Yeah. That would make it a lot harder, I'm assuming, because it sounds like not easy to get to. But holding two people hostage, if you're just one person at a place like the quarry, sounds difficult. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Anytime there's more than one victim, anytime there's a hostage situation or there's more than one victim, it always confuses me because I'm like, I personally don't understand how you could control two different people. Like one of them would run or one of them would scream, right? Watching enough crime movies, you know, usually the, the kidnapper or whoever, the violent offender will hold a gun or a knife to one of the victims to control the other one and say, hey, if you do anything weird, I'm going to slit your sister's throat or I'm going to, 
you know, shoot your wife in the head or whatever it is. Yeah. And as I think as a sister in general, but I, I'm an older sister and I don't think I could leave my younger sister. I don't think I would run even if I had a chance to. Because you wouldn't want to leave her behind. Exactly. Yeah. No, I could I could definitely see myself if I was in this situation and someone was threatening my sister and says, hey, if you run or you call the police or you scream, she gets it. That that makes people comply. Yeah. So it could have just been one person or it could have been multiple yeah, and we don't know if they had any, like, uh, stricture marks on their wrists or feet from being tied up or anything, so... And I didn't see any kind of evidence discussed on whether or not, like, the police conclusively determined that they were killed at the quarry or if, like you said, their bodies were just discarded there. The police probably know one way or the other, but I don't think it was ever published. Yeah, weird. But do you want to talk about your theory and your suspect? Yeah, Another case that happened literally days before the Raker sisters went missing. Um, a woman named Georgianne Dreher met a young man by the name of Lloyd Lee Welch in the town of St. Cloud at the exact same shopping center that the Raker sisters went missing. And Lloyd Lee Welch was a traveling carnival worker. He was looking to make friends because he was new to the area. And so Georgianne and Lloyd agreed to meet up at a quarry and hang out. They hadn't been at the quarry for very long when Lloyd's mood suddenly shifted. He pulled out a knife, sliced Georgianne's pants off, and told her to do what he said or die. Lloyd sexually assaulted Georgianne at knife point. Georgianne said during her hellish encounter with Lloyd, he talked about his sexual fantasies of sisters. Specifically, he talked about assaulting sisters. Luckily, a car pulled up at the quarry and Georgianne was able to escape. Three days later, the Raker sisters went missing. Georgianne reported her attack to the police and begged them to look into Lloyd as a suspect, even telling them about the things he said to her when he was assaulting her, but police refused to link Lloyd as a suspect. The Raker sisters, we know, were found a month later in that very same quarry where she was assaulted. In March 1975, six months after the Raker sisters went missing, two sisters in the Washington, D.C. area went missing. In 2014, Lloyd Lee Welch was charged with their murders, and in 2017, he was sentenced to 48 years in prison for the murders of Sheila and Catherine Lyon, the two young girls who went missing in Washington, D.C. And Georgianne is absolutely convinced that Lloyd killed the Raker sisters, and she has been a strong advocate of proving that for her whole life ever since she was assaulted by Lloyd. And it's crazy that Lloyd killed the Lion sisters, Sheila and Catherine, in 1975, but he was only implicated in 2014. And there really were only two reasons this happened. The first one is that a witness saw the Lion sisters being watched by a young man and actually confronted him for being creepy. And when the Lion sisters went missing, the witness helped a sketch artist recreate the person of interest. And the sketch actually looked a lot like Lloyd. But the sketch didn't even help police because a week after the girls went missing, Lloyd returned to the shopping center where police were still canvassing for witnesses and Lloyd decided to insert himself in the investigation. He told the police that he saw the Lion sisters get in the back of a car driven by an older man. So police took Lloyd's name and witness statement and they didn't see a connection until 39 years later when one of Lloyd's family members came forward about helping Lloyd burn some suspicious duffel bags. So police decided to interview him 39 years later, and after a few interviews, Lloyd confessed to abducting the Lion sisters and later pled guilty to killing them. And Georgianne has reached out to Lloyd many times while he's been in prison, hoping to get a confession for the murder of the Raker sisters, but he maintains his innocence to this day. This man was in the exact same place at the exact same time. It seems kind of really crazy to be a coincidence. That is, that would be an insane coincidence, right? Okay, so someone close to the Raker's demographic, which is like a a young woman or a teenage girl, is she's claiming she was assaulted at knife point in the exact same quarry that the Raker sisters were found deceased in. And Georgianne is saying that her attacker also used a knife to control her. Yes. And something that Georgianne was super, super insistent about, like even now, is that his weird sexual fantasies about assaulting and murdering sisters but is what he was explaining to her while he was assaulting her and that's what made her think oh my god this is the same guy who killed the raker sisters and then who killed the lion sisters like it seems like a very strange coincidence 
Especially that it's the exact same quarry. Exactly. Just the quarry. And all of the things. The use of the knife. Yep. Like, the same weekend. Uh-huh. What are the odds that there's two murderers in the exact same place, the exact same time, <laughs> the exact same method? Okay. So Lloyd is a very, very strong suspect. Very convincing suspect, yes. He was a violent rapist. And he was... So he was probably in and out of jail. Yes, he was a registered sex offender and he had uh, molested some young girls and he, he did it a lot, actually. Not just one eight-year-old and one 10-year-old. He he was a regular offender. And so he was in prison up until he was tried for the Lion Sisters murders in 2014. Okay. Luckily, he was off the streets. Okay, so this almost sounds like a just like open and shut case. Like, okay, it was Lloyd. Like, obviously, like what are the odds that you have this knife-wielding maniac that's assaulting young girls in the same town, in the same quarry, the same weekend. It does sound like that, but there's actually even more to the story. We do know that Susie, she was hidden. Her body was concealed and put underneath some brush, which also would explain why maybe the helicopters flying over wouldn't have been able to see her. And then Mary, she was she was also concealed, but Susie was in the brush and Mary was in the water. And I wanted to talk to you, Kaylee, and see if maybe you had some insight. My assumption, is that maybe she was thrown into the water to conceal signs of sexual assault because we know that she was missing her pants and underwear, but that's that's my best theory. Well, I have a question about why they were thrown into a quarry in the first place. Like, I feel like a local person who lived there would know that quarries are visited often. So did the person who put them here want them to be found at some point? Knowing that the quarries were popular spots, especially for children to play, it feels weird to me that somebody intentionally placed the bodies of the people they murdered there, thinking that they wouldn't be found. These are hot spots, but they're summertime hot spots. I don't know if it's a coincidence, but this is Labor Day, which is marking the end of summer. Like the weather's gonna turn cold. This is Minnesota. It probably gets cold really fast. And so in the off season, people probably aren't going there. They may have even been planning on like, maybe they won't be found for another six months when the weather warms up. But even then, like they were going to be found. They wouldn't disappear. Like, like maybe Mary's body at the bottom of the quarry for sure would eventually decompose. But, but Susie's body was in the brushes. Like I, they were going to be found at some point. So either this person wanted them to be found or didn't care or didn't think it through. And I've actually seen, I agree. Yeah. I think the police when, when actually the FBI profiled the perpetrator of this crime. And one of the conclusions that they came to was that this was someone who was most likely young and inexperienced. And that makes sense with our profiles of the two people we think did it or could have done it. But I I do agree with you. Uh, I think Mary was intentionally placed in the water to potentially hide signs of sexual assault. Police stated they believed the killer or killers may have been from the local area, but they never elaborated why they thought this. There was a man named Herb Notch that was questioned by police regarding Mary and Susie's deaths, but only after he was arrested for a different crime with striking similarities. Almost two years after Mary and Susie's murders, the fall of 1976, a 14-year-old girl named Sue Dukowitz was working the cash register at her father's store in St. Cloud when two young men came in with a gun and ordered her to empty the till. Except they didn't stop there. They then told Sue to get in their car and they proceeded to drive her to a secluded gravel pit. According to Notch's accomplice, Notch then took out a knife and sliced through the front of her sweater and bra, sexually assaulted her, and then stabbed her repeatedly before hiding her body under some brush. Sound familiar? According to a Fox 9 News article from September 2016, Mary Raker apparently also had her sweater and bra cut down the front, and you may remember that Susie's body was hidden under some brush. This is the most incredible part of this story, though. Sue Dukowitz didn't die. After being sexually assaulted, stabbed repeatedly, and left for dead, she managed to walk half a mile through the darkness toward a light and knocked on the door of someone's house. 
She made a full recovery in the hospital and was able to identify her attackers. Police found Herb Notch and his accomplice and they made full confessions. That is incredible that this 14 year old girl gets stabbed. Not just like stabbed once or twice, but it sounds like they stabbed her repeatedly. They assumed that she was dead. But no, she she gets up, she walks half a mile. I don't even like walking half a mile when I'm in perfect health. <laughs> Let's just say, I don't think I could have done what Sue Duckowitz did. I would have just laid down and been like, this is my time to go. Yeah, what an incredible human being that she was able to do that. Absolutely insane. A judge ordered Notch to undergo a psychiatric evaluation, and court records show doctors determined he had a fearlessly savage quality about him and was a very dangerous person, and in the right situation, a homicidal individual. He seems to lack any significant remorse regarding his alleged offenses, the court records showed. Notch was offered a deal. He pleaded guilty to robbery and kidnapping, but the charges of attempted murder and sexual assault were dismissed. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. His accomplice served seven years in prison for his role in the crime and has stayed out of trouble ever since. He told Fox 9 investigators he knows nothing about what happened to the Raker girls. I think you already know what I'm going to say next, yeah. which is why were the sexual assault and attempted murder charges dropped? Was she not obviously stabbed? How do they explain that away? Who, who has to pay for that? I... Okay, so I... After reading this, I looked into plea bargains because I, I know generally about them, but I didn't understand like why they're really, really common. And the number one common reason plea bargains exist is because it's easier on the court system if you don't have to go to court. If you have a plea bargain, that means you have a confession and that means you don't have to go to court and do all the court things. And so you can just get a judge to do sentencing. So you skip the whole trial process. So it just makes it easier for prosecutors. And that kills me, number one. I have no idea why they dropped the kidnapping and sexual assault and attempted murder charges. That seems... Because if if he doesn't go to court and he doesn't get convicted, then those things aren't on his record. Exactly. And I don't know why they wouldn't want that on his record. He's a homicidal maniac. Because <laughs> they just want him locked up. So in their mind, they're like, okay, uh whatever it's like throwing jello at a wall and just like trying to get something to stick yeah and remember um jessica roach like larry duane hall was only ever convicted of kidnapping because they couldn't nail down the murder charge but they're like you know what whatever gets him in jail and off the streets and stops him from hurting people we're gonna go with it yep which there's no fucking justice in that sometimes though. There's like, I understand Jessica Roach's case because it, it was a little bit trickier. It just was, but this seems really cut and dry. <laughs> like, yeah, but also like we've talked about this before. I wonder if it's a case of Sue Duckowitz, she would have been traumatized all over again, having to go through court and have to relive and face her attacker. That is possible, but could he appeal? Like, like, does not having murder and sexual assault on his record make him more likely for, like, an appeal process? I would think so. It's very possible that his accomplice, Herb Notch's accomplice who was with him, was in it just for the money and Herb took it to a, a new level when he kidnapped Sue. I mean, we all have those friends where we make plans and we think we know what we're doing that night and then they take it to a whole nother level. Right? Like, just don't have friends <laughs> like Herb Notch because he takes it to a level nobody should ever go to. I'm talking about you, Kaylee. Oh, shit. <laughs> Listen, I only do vigilante work, okay? That's it. I don't do homicide for homicide's sake. I do vigilante shit. That's it. I thought we were just going to do karaoke tonight. <laughs> it's karaoke with a twist. <laughs> See, I was, I was right with the appeals process. It gets worse because Herb Notch only had to serve 10 years of his 40 year sentence and he immediately got into more trouble with the law. In 1988, his girlfriend accused him of breaking into her home and raping her at knife point. 
That sounds familiar. And then again, in 1992, another female acquaintance claimed that he tied her up in the back of his truck and raped her. It took the Minnesota Fugitive Task Force 14 months to track him down, but they eventually found him living in Phoenix, Arizona under his brother's name. He was returned to Minnesota to stand trial on rape charges, but he was acquitted. I... I will never understand. I will never fucking understand why we let men get away with rape so much. I, it makes me like to the, it brings me to the point of homicide. It really fucking does. He's, he's out after 10 years and just, he just keeps on trucking. He tried to kill Sue. He tried to kill a 14 year old girl. I, yeah. <sighs> and the, <laughs> The St. Cloud police have the audacity to be like, we don't really have any violent crime in this town. It's mostly just domestic disputes. There were at least two homicidal knife-wielding maniacs in this town at the exact same time. <laughs> they just think it was a fluke. Like, <laughs> I don't think it is at this point, you guys. It's a real quiet town. We only have two homicidal maniacs. <laughs> just two. The bar is in hell. But yeah. So, so that makes me absolutely uh, insane. <sighs> Anyone listening who's familiar with true crime or listens to a lot of true crime is probably not surprised to hear that this man got acquitted. And we've talked about it in other episodes. So like, this reminds me of Curtis Thompson from episode 14. Also, it reminds me of the Kansas City Strangler from episode 12, where we have these men who just keep assaulting women and we continually release them to do it again. At the time of Mary and Susie's murders, Notch was actually employed at the shopping center where the girls had gone shopping that day. He was 15 years old. He lived in the same small town as Mary's grandparents. It's highly likely that Mary knew Herb. So the idea of a 15-year-old committing this heinous crime is really depressing, but it also kind of makes sense. My only question is, how would Herb have gotten them to the quarry if he's only 15 years old? Like, did they all walk together because they knew each other? Did he charm them and they thought he was a friend? Or did he have a car and was driving at only 15 years old? I guess at 15, I mean, I could drive at 15 with my learner's permit. Okay, this is why I don't think it was Notch. This is why I think it was Lloyd who murdered the Raker sisters. He was a little bit older and his MO just fits better. I'm I'm like 50-50. Like if you told me that it was either one of them, I would believe you. I know this is this absolutely crazy. But Herb Notch never confessed to killing Mary or Susie Raker in the fall of 1974. But something really interesting, uh, their their mother, the Raker sister's mother, Rita, confronted Herb Notch in the hospital, hoping to get a deathbed confession. So Rita said, I felt my only hope was that there would be a deathbed confession. That's honestly how I felt. This is where it was just going to end. I hoped that I would live long enough to see that. Raker decided to visit Notch in person after learning he had been admitted to the hospital, wearing a hidden microphone to record their conversation. Deputies and her son waited nearby as she went into Notch's room by herself. I walked in and I told him I was the mother of Mary and Suzanne and that I had waited 42 years for this. She said, I needed some answers. She said it took a few moments for Notch to realize who was confronting him. He just pointed right at me and said, I give you my word, I didn't do it, she recalled. He was totally in denial. I found him to be very angry, a very hard and very bitter person. There was no sense of remorse at all. She continued to try and make conversation with him, hoping he might offer some clues about the murders. Another thing he said to me that I thought was really strange, why can't you just put it behind you? I told him, because they were my children and as long as I was alive, I was going to be searching for their killer. And then he said something which might be interpreted as a hint of a confession. I'm going to hell. I said, you've got a few days left. You can make your peace with God before you die. He just said, I'm going to hell and I don't do church. It is weird that he was like, why can't you just put it behind you? Like that's- Yeah. What I don't understand is if he was guilty, why would someone not confess on their deathbed? Like you're about to die. Why, why hold on to that? I think there's lots of reasons to like you're about to die and you're having an existential crisis like you're coming to terms with your life and your reality and all the things that you did and maybe even your legacy the trail that you left behind you as a human being and adding that 
to it after you got away with number one, so much shit. Like he got away with a lot of shit. And so he kept doing it. But did he ever confront the fact that he was doing something wrong in the first place when he was doing those things and having to confront the potential murder of those two little girls? If he did do it, I can see why somebody would not want to confess that on their deathbed. It doesn't sound like he left behind a good legacy anyway, though. He didn't, but I I think think most people knew that he was a garbage person. Yeah, but I don't think he did. (laughs) Yeah. No, I I get what you're saying. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The confrontation between the 82-year-old mother and the suspected killer of her two girls lasted 21 minutes. Notch died a week later, but the Raker case remains open as investigators try to find more evidence to connect him to the crime. One of the more haunting parts of this case was one of the last entries 15-year-old Mary Raker made in her diary before she was killed, which read, Should I die, I ask that my stuffed animals be given to Leah, and that if I am murdered, see that justice wins over. I have a few reasons to fear for my life. What I ask is important. Should we talk about that? What in the entire fuck is that? Like, at 15, I can assure you I did not think I was going to be murdered. Like, no. That's not normal. No, that's that's not. That makes me think, like, was she being, like, stalked or abused or harassed by somebody and she didn't tell anybody? Oh, you know what? That actually, I didn't think about that, but she's also Catholic. Uh-huh. And you and I both know, I won't speak for you, but in my experience, being raised religious, maybe she had a boyfriend or was seeing someone or potentially, you know, was just doing normal teenage things and her parents didn't know about it and she was in danger. It's possible she was doing normal teenager things with bad people. I don't know. It's just a theory. We have nothing to back it up, but just her diary entry is weird enough. If she's thinking, like even the fact that she says, I have a few reasons to fear for my life. She knew somebody was going to be reading her journal. If she died, that's... Which is why it makes me think that whoever did this, maybe was someone close to her age, like a peer. It does make uh, me side-eye her notch a little bit more. But I I think I'm still convinced it was uh, Lloyd Welch. Like, it's possible that he was in town for a little while because he was a traveling carnival person. He was in town for a little while and tried to make friends with with Mary, 15-year-old Mary. I don't know. Th- this case is just so freaking weird. And if the police hadn't dropped the ball in the very beginning, it's possible that a lot more evidence would be found and their their killer would have been found a lot sooner. What we know, according to Georgie Ann, is that a few days before Mary and Susie went missing and were murdered, Lloyd had attempted to commit sexual assault and potentially murder, but he was interrupted and he didn't get to finish. I mean, he didn't get to finish the murder, but he did sexually assault Georgianne. Yes, yes. But what if his fantasy was to murder her yeah. and he didn't get to do that? So it makes sense that someone like that, someone as psychotic as Lloyd, would then try a few days later to do the exact same thing in the exact same place. I That's why I think it was Lloyd. Honestly, I think that he was going to kill Georgianne and didn't get to and that she was going to be the victim. And Lee Lloyd Lee Welch is still alive And he's serving the rest of his prison sentence for sexually assaulting two young girls. And then as soon as that 25-year sentence is up, he is going to be serving his 48-year sentence out of a Virginia prison. And he's like 60-something years old, so he will spend the rest of his life in prison. Currently, investigators are still asking for witnesses to come forward and hopefully provide accounts of the girls' movements after they left the shopping center. If you know something, especially if you saw the Raker girls on the afternoon of Labor Day 1974, you should contact the Stearns County Sheriff's Office at 320-251-4240. There's still a reward of up to $50,000 being offered for information on the murders. Be sure to find Crime Soup Podcast on social media and let us know your thoughts and theories. You can follow us on TikTok at Crime Soup Podcast and on Instagram and Twitter at Crime underscore Soup. As always, we'll see you next Tuesday for your next helping of delicious crime soup. Bon appetit.